Antidepressants are used to treat clinical depression, also known as major depressive disorder. Let's review the basics of the pharmacology of antidepressants. It's important to realize that the exact cause of clinical depression is not completely understood. However, there is evidence to suggest that clinical depression occurs due to low levels of neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. This is the monoamine hypothesis, and this hypothesis suggests that clinical depression occurs due to low levels of neurotransmitters, particularly low levels of serotonin, low levels of noradrenaline, and low levels of dopamine in the central nervous system. And the hypothesis suggests that low levels of these transmitters are what causes the symptoms of depression. Antidepressants generally work by increasing the availability of these neurotransmitters in the central nervous system to try to improve the symptoms of depression. There are different classes of antidepressants. One class of antidepressants are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as the SSRIs. Another class of antidepressants are called the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, also known as the SNRIs. Another class of antidepressants are called the tricyclic antidepressants, which are called TCAs. The other class of antidepressants are the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, also known as the MAOIs. Antidepressants which do not belong to any of these classes are called atypical antidepressants and include drugs such as metazapine. Let's discuss each of these antidepressants. In the central nervous system, there are serotonergic neurons, which means that the neurons produce serotonin as a neurotransmitter. This is a schematic representation of the presynaptic neuron of a serotonergic neuron. And this is a schematic representation of the postsynaptic neuron. In the presynaptic neuron of the serotonergic neurons, there are vesicles containing serotonin, and remember serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and it's represented here. This serotonin is synthesized from tryptophan, which is an amino acid. And serotonin is also known as 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is why serotonin is often abbreviated as 5-HT. When an action potential arrives at the presynaptic neuron of the serotonergic neuron, this will cause the vesicles containing the serotonin to fuse with the presynaptic membrane, and this will eventually lead to the serotonin being secreted into the synaptic cleft. There are receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, which are serotonin receptors, abbreviated as 5-HT receptors. The serotonin produced by the presynaptic neurons can bind to these receptors, and this can trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Back on the presynaptic neuron, there is a transporter called a serotonin reuptake transporter, and this transporter does what the name suggests. It allows serotonin to be taken up again by the presynaptic neurons. The serotonin that is taken up by the presynaptic neuron can be packaged into vesicles for the next action potential. Now let's talk about SSRIs. SSRIs interfere with this process. SSRIs inhibit the serotonin reuptake transporters, and hence they inhibit serotonin reuptake back into the presynaptic neurons. This means that there is more serotonin accumulating within the synaptic cleft, so this increases the availability of serotonin to bind to the serotonin receptors on the postsynaptic neurons, and there's more serotonin available to trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. The increased availability of serotonin within the synaptic cleft is thought to help with the symptoms of clinical depression based on that monoamine hypothesis. SSRIs are the first line pharmacological agent used to treat clinical depression. Let's review some of the key points related to SSRIs. Examples of SSRIs include fluoxetine, citalopram, sertraline, and paroxetine. We've already reviewed the mechanism of SSRIs, which is that they inhibit serotonin reuptake into the presynaptic neuron, and this increases the availability of serotonin within the synaptic cleft. It's important to realize that it usually takes around four to six weeks before improvements are seen with SSRIs. In terms of the side effects of SSRIs, SSRIs generally have milder side effects compared to the other antidepressants, which is the main reason why SSRIs are used first line. Patients can develop side effects on SSRIs, and these side effects include GI distress, such as nausea and vomiting. Patients commonly can develop insomnia and agitation. An important side effect to remember is sexual dysfunction, and this includes reduced libido and erectile dysfunction. And patients can also develop SIADH, which stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH Secretion. SIADH means that there is too much ADH in the body, and too much ADH means that there is too much water being reabsorbed from the kidneys, and this will reduce the serum osmolality, and this can cause the sodium levels in the blood to drop, 
and this increases the risk of the patient developing hyponatremia. There are some specific effects to remember. Citalopram can cause a prolonged QT interval, which increases the risk of the patient developing cardiac arrhythmias. Fluoxetine and paroxetine are both very potent cytochrome P450 inhibitors. Cytochrome P450 enzymes are enzymes within the liver which are responsible for the metabolism of many drugs and toxins such as benzodiazepines or phenytoin. Because these drugs inhibit these enzymes, this will reduce the rate of elimination of many drugs and toxins and increases their concentration within the blood and this increases the risk of an overdose on a particular drug such as benzodiazepines. Another key point to remember is that SSRIs are generally safe in overdose compared to the other antidepressants. In terms of the drug interactions, the key drug interaction to remember is that SSRIs can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome when it is used with other drugs that increase serotonin levels. We will discuss serotonin syndrome in detail in a future video, but for now just remember, serotonin syndrome is characterized by excess levels of serotonin within the body, so when SSRIs are combined with other drugs that increase serotonin levels, this significantly increases the risk of the patient developing serotonin syndrome, which is a medical emergency. We've already discussed how serotonergic neurons work, but remember, there are other types of neurons in the central nervous system. This is a diagram representing a noradrenergic neuron, with this being the presynaptic neuron and this being the postsynaptic neuron. Similar to the serotonergic neurons, the noradrenergic neurons also have vesicles in the presynaptic neuron. However, these vesicles will contain noradrenaline as a neurotransmitter, represented here. When an action potential arrives at the presynaptic neuron, the vesicles will fuse with the presynaptic membrane of the noradrenergic neuron, and the noradrenaline neurotransmitters will be released into the synaptic cleft. On the postsynaptic neuron, there are receptors which are noradrenaline receptors, and the noradrenaline released from the presynaptic neuron can bind with these receptors and trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Similar to the serotonergic neurons, there are transporters on the presynaptic neuron, and these transporters allow noradrenaline to be taken up from the synaptic cleft back into the presynaptic neuron, and the presynaptic neuron can package this noradrenaline back into the vesicles. Serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, work by inhibiting both serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake in serotonergic neurons and noradrenergic neurons. This will increase the concentration of serotonin and noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft, and by increasing the availability of both these neurotransmitters, this is thought to help with the symptoms of clinical depression based on the monoamine hypothesis. SNRIs are generally used second line to the SSRIs. Let's review some of the key points related to the SNRIs. Examples of SNRIs include venlafaxine and duloxetine. Interestingly, duloxetine is also used to treat neuropathic pain such as in diabetic neuropathy and fibromyalgia. We've already reviewed the mechanism of these drugs, which is that they inhibit both serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake and increase the availability of both these neurotransmitters. Similar to the SSRIs, SNRIs usually take around four to six weeks before improvements can be seen. In terms of the side effect profile of SNRIs, they are very similar to the side effects of SSRIs in that SNRIs can also cause insomnia, nausea, and sexual dysfunctions. Because SNRIs also work by increasing the availability of noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft, there is an increased risk of the patient developing a higher blood pressure because noradrenaline can increase blood pressure by causing peripheral vasoconstriction. So this is why it's important that the patient's blood pressure is well controlled before starting a patient on SNRIs. Other side effects include sweating and headaches, and this is again due to the increased availability of noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft. Finally, in terms of the drug interactions, SNRIs will also increase the risk of serotonin syndrome when it is used with other drugs that increase serotonin levels. So we've already discussed how serotonergic neurons and noradrenergic neurons work. Tricyclic antidepressants, or TCAs, work very similar to the SNRIs in that TCAs also inhibit both serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake from the synaptic cleft back into the presynaptic neurons. So this will again increase the availability of serotonin and noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft, which will help with the symptoms of clinical depression based on the monoamine hypothesis. A key point about tricyclic antidepressants is that they are not very specific and they also inhibit other receptors in the body. In the body, there are other receptors such as alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, histamine receptors, 
and muscarinic receptors. TCAs can inhibit all of these receptors in the body, and this is why TCAs have a very high side effect profile, which is why they are no longer generally used to treat depression. Tricyclic antidepressants are generally used third line to treat depression. Let's review some of the key points related to TCAs. The main example of a TCA drug that is used is amitriptyline. We've already reviewed the mechanism, which is that TCAs will inhibit serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake from the synaptic cleft back into the presynaptic neuron, so it increases the availability of both serotonin and noradrenaline. But remember, TCAs will also inhibit alpha-1, histamine, and muscarinic receptors. In terms of the side effects of TCAs, TCAs have a very large side effect profile. Because TCAs inhibit muscarinic receptors, TCAs have very strong anti-muscarinic effects. These side effects are very similar to the side effects of atropine, which is an anticholinergic drug. These side effects include tachycardia, urinary retention, confusion, hallucinations, dry mouth, constipation, and many other anti-muscarinic effects. Patients can also feel effects of sedation, and this is due to the inhibition of histamine receptors. Patients are also at risk of developing orthostatic hypotension, and this is due to the inhibition of alpha-1 receptors. TCAs can be very dangerous in an overdose. Overdosing on TCAs can lead to cardiotoxicity, comas, and seizures. In terms of the cardiotoxicity, TCA overdose can lead to dangerous arrhythmias such as ventricular fibrillation. In severe toxicity, intravenous bicarbonate can be given to reduce the risk of arrhythmias and seizures. And finally, in terms of the drug interactions, again, TCAs can increase the risk of serotonin syndrome when it is used with other drugs that increase serotonin levels. TCAs in particular have a very high risk of causing serotonin syndrome, which is why it's very important to be very cautious when switching patients from other antidepressants to a TCA. So we've already reviewed how serotonergic neurons and noradrenergic neurons work. In the presynaptic neurons of both the serotonergic neurons and the noradrenergic neurons, there are enzymes called monoamine oxidase enzymes. These enzymes will degrade the neurotransmitters that are taken up from the synaptic cleft in both the serotonergic neurons and the noradrenergic neurons. So in the serotonergic neuron, the monoamine oxidase enzymes will degrade the serotonin so it can't be used. And in the noradrenergic neurons, the monoamine oxidase enzymes will degrade the noradrenaline taken up from the synaptic cleft. Now, if we talk about monoamine oxidase inhibitors, these drugs will inhibit the monoamine oxidase enzymes in the serotonergic neurons and the noradrenergic neurons. In the serotonergic neurons, this means that the serotonin that is taken up will not be degraded by the monoamine oxidase enzymes, and so serotonin levels will increase. In the noradrenergic neurons, this will mean that the noradrenaline that is taken up will not be degraded by the monoamine oxidase enzymes, so there is more noradrenaline in the presynaptic neuron. So more of the serotonin will be packaged into vesicles, and more of the noradrenaline will be packaged into vesicles. And overall, this will increase the availability of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, as well as increase the availability of noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft, and this will help with the symptoms of clinical depression based on the monoamine hypothesis. Please note that monoamine oxidase inhibitors will also inhibit monoamine oxidase enzymes in dopaminergic neurons, so it will also increase the availability of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. In the GIT, there are also monoamine oxidase enzymes. The monoamine oxidase enzymes in the GIT are very important for the metabolism of a particular compound called tyramine. Foods that contain tyramine includes foods such as cheese, wine, and beer. The monoamine oxidase enzymes will normally break down the tyramine so it can't be absorbed into the blood. However, if a patient is on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, these drugs will inhibit these monoamine oxidase enzymes, and this means that tyramine will not be broken down by the monoamine oxidase enzymes, so tyramine levels will start to increase, and more tyramine will be absorbed through the GIT. The problem with this tyramine is that tyramine will increase noradrenaline release, and by increasing the release of noradrenaline, this will increase the risk of the patient developing a hypertensive crisis because noradrenaline will cause peripheral vasoconstriction and increase the patient's blood pressure. So this is a major side effect to be aware of with monoamine oxidase inhibitors, where if a patient on a monoamine oxidase inhibitors eats food rich in tyramine, they are at a high risk of developing a hypertensive crisis. Let's summarize the key points related to monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Examples of monoamine oxidase inhibitors include meclobamide and phenelzine. We've already reviewed the mechanism of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which is that they inhibit monoamine oxidase enzymes 
and therefore increase the availability of serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine in the synaptic cleft. The main side effect to be aware of for monoamine oxidase inhibitors is that they can cause a hypertensive crisis when eating tyramine-rich foods. Symptoms of a hypertensive crisis includes hypertension, tachycardia, hypothermia, agitation, and arrhythmias. In terms of the other drug interactions, monoamine oxidase inhibitors have an increased risk of serotonin syndrome when used with other drugs that increase serotonin levels. We've already discussed how serotonergic neurons and noradrenergic neurons work. On the presynaptic membranes of both these neurons, there are alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. When serotonin binds to the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors of the presynaptic membrane of the serotonergic neuron, this causes an inhibitory response on the serotonergic neurons, and this reduces the secretion of serotonin from the presynaptic membrane. When no adrenaline binds to the presynaptic membrane alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, this will also cause an inhibitory response on the noradrenergic neuron, and this will reduce the secretion of noradrenaline from the presynaptic membrane. Mirtazapine is an atypical antidepressant, and one of the ways it works is that it will inhibit these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. By inhibiting these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors in the serotonergic neuron, this means that there is no more inhibitory response on the presynaptic neuron. And in the noradrenergic neuron, this will mean that there will no longer be an inhibitory response on the presynaptic neuron. So overall, this will increase the availability of both serotonin and noradrenaline within the synaptic cleft, and this will help with the symptoms of clinical depression based on the monoamine hypothesis. It's important to note that metazapine has effects on other receptors, particularly histamine receptors. Metazapine will inhibit histamine receptors as well. Metazapine also has important effects on serotonin receptors. There are different types of serotonin receptors. There are 5-HT1 receptors, there are 5-HT2 receptors, and there are 5-HT3 receptors. And these are all different types of serotonin receptors. Metazapine will inhibit both 5-HT2 and 5-HT3 receptors. This might confuse you, but what this means is that there is increased availability of serotonin to bind to the 5-HT1 receptors. And 5-HT1 receptors have been more strongly linked with the symptoms of depression compared to the other types of serotonin receptors. So metazapine will cause more serotonin to bind to the 5-HT1 receptors, and this will help with the symptoms of depression. Let's summarize the key points related to metazapine. We've already reviewed the mechanisms of metazapine, which is that they cause inhibition of alpha-2 adrenergic receptors on the presynaptic membranes of both serotonergic and noradrenergic neurons, which reduces the inhibitory response, which leads to more serotonin and noradrenaline being released. Metazapine will also inhibit 5-HT2 and 5-HT3 receptors, which leads to more free serotonin to bind to the 5-HT1 receptors. And finally, metazapine will also inhibit histamine receptors. In terms of the side effects of metazapine, metazapine can cause weight gain. Metazapine can increase appetite, which can be a positive side effect. Because of the inhibition of histamine receptors, metazapine can cause sedation. And finally, metazapine has very minimal sexual dysfunction side effects. In terms of the drug interactions, metazapine has an increased risk of serotonin syndrome when used with other drugs that increase serotonin levels. And that is a summary of the pharmacology of antidepressants.